I've decided at least for the time being to upload my live remote demonstrations that I've been doing to YouTube. This particular demonstration was done for the Rocky Mountain Wood Turning Club, one of my favorite clubs. This demonstration is on embellishing, or as I like to say, changing the appearance of wood. So you can watch this video. It's a little bit long. You can skip through it. You can choose to watch it or not watch it. But anyway, enjoy. Thank you very much. Today's topic, changing the appearance of wood. Uh, I'm going to do some embellishing and I've done this uh, demonstration a number of times and I've kind of come to the conclusion that it's very difficult to actually uh, accomplish something you know, like make something during this period. So I'm going to show you lots of different uh, embellishing techniques that I do. And uh, if you have any questions, please jump in there. I apologize for the delay. I hope it wasn't something I did, but it probably was. I'm not going to get to all these embellishing techniques here. Uh, metal reactive paint, and I'll show you a couple examples of that in a second. Um, that's something that's really cool to do. And I do this on some of my my artwork, uh, it's, uh, well, it, it is what it sounds like. The paint actually has metal powder in it and you spray a solution on it and you get a reaction and it's just really neat because you can almost watch it happening. I'm gonna do a lot of texturing. I'm gonna use some gilt cream. Uh, I couldn't convince my wife to do some of her pyography, but it's just, uh, with a limited amount of time, it's very difficult to, jam too much stuff in here. I will be doing some burning and scorching. And it's kind of nice because I'm in my own shop and I don't have to ask anybody if the smoke detector is going to go off so I can just, uh, you know, burn away. I don't think I'm going to get to off-center work. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. Um, metal leaf. I've got a little video I will play on gilding. And I call it gilding, but what I do really isn't proper gilding. And uh, I don't know if some of you guys do it. You probably do a better job than I do. <clears throat> but it's really fun to do. And it's what, what I do, my approach is not difficult to do. I like to say a third grader could, could probably accomplish the same thing. Coloring, uh, we'll talk a little bit about coloring. I do a lot of coloring. Okay, and I'll show you some pictures of that. Carving, uh, the carving I do is more with, uh, you know, electric carving implements and that sort of thing. And I'll show you that. And we'll show you a little bit of airbrushing. All right. All right, I'm going. Okay. Now, I, this is just a bowl. This is a box elder bowl. And it doesn't look like it's been embellished, but my comment would be that whatever we do to a piece of wood, uh, we're really embellishing it. I've just got to finish on this and, uh, you know, it's been embellished a little bit. Here's another one. That didn't show up in the, in the frame very well. There we go. And that's a really, really nice piece of uh, maple burl. And I didn't do anything to that other than just... Uh, put a finish on it. And sometimes I get a piece of wood that it's like, ah, I really can't do much with it. You know, I, I, I shouldn't, and, I, and I, I don't. I didn't color that piece. This is kind of a Nick Agar uh, bowl. And when I do these, I probably only done one or two like this, kind of that sunset effect. And I really like to come up with different colors myself. I don't want to copy Nick directly, although there's probably 10,000 people around the world who have done that. And uh, Nick is a friend of mine, and he's just an amazing artist. If you've never been on his website, you should go on his website. What he does is just incredible. Uh, and I'll be kind of... Uh, referencing Nick a lot in, in some of the things I do tonight with texturing. He's got some really good videos out there on, uh, on texturing. This is another bowl I did. This really isn't a sunset bowl, but the colors are a little bit different with some uh, texturing on the center. And I'll do some of that tonight. 
this a little lidded box, and my wife looked at that and said it looks like an eyeball. Kind of does. Little, little bloodshot eyeball. Um, this is a birdhouse ornament that I do, and uh, I like to have that, that roof like hard maple, and you can really do some neat texturing and coloring in the top of that. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna try to change the wrong way. Let's get get this in the frame. Nope, I I cut the uh, finial off on this. This is one of my hollow forms, and I like to do these because I can do thread chasing in the lid, in the finial area there, and these I I need to do a demo dedicated to this kind of coloring because it's really time consuming and it's it's hard to even explain. Um, Maybe I could, my, my wife is sitting over here and I'm going to have her see if, would you go get one of my hollow forms over there? Get, get one that's partially colored. She's my, uh, she's a brains behind this outfit and, and she's my gopher, my, my cameraman, camera lady. Here's another one that came out just crazy. And if I can go back to this other one, I start the coloring process on the inside. Okay, and if you know who Chris Pitlick is, he's from, uh, I think, Sandy, Utah. Uh, he has really taught me over the years. Whenever we were still meeting, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to show those when I get into a camera. Okay. Um, he's really helped me over the years personally do this. Uh, he doesn't really do the finial lid part of this project, but uh, he's taught me a lot on coloring. Um, there's another one, and this one is just crazy. I mean, I, I take a lot of credit for stuff that nature did, but there's so much going on in this piece with grain and figure, and, you know, all I had to do was add a little color on the inside. And what I do is I uh, start the coloring with a pipette or a pipette, and some of you are, are familiar with that. It's like a really long eyedropper. <clears throat> and once the color doesn't start, doesn't come through anymore, I color the rest of it with an airbrush from the outside. And that's pretty much how I use my airbrush. <clears throat> it's more like a paintbrush. Okay. I had a phone call and I rejected them, whoever it was. There's another, another one of my pieces. Um, and I've actually sold most of these. That's another piece that just, it's Box Elder. And if you're interested in doing this, Box Elder works better than any wood I've, I've seen. I think Chris Pitlick does a lot of poplar, poplar burl. I've tried maple and it doesn't really work very well. I get the uh, box elder maybe three sixteenths of an inch and the color wicks through from the inside to the outside. Now here's a good example of uh, metal reactive paint. Those turquoise splotches around the circumference there on that one ring, that's a uh, metal reactive paint. <clears throat> and you don't always know what you're going to get when you use that, but it's really fun. You can get it at Woodcraft, Craft Supplies, uh, different places. There's another one, a little bit of texturing, coloring, some um, metal reactive paint on the outside of that. There's another one. Um, oh, and I'm going to send these. This is a PowerPoint, and I'll send this to somebody, and you can distribute this to the club. Now, those are just some different items I've done. This is what I'm going to do next. I'm going to do some texturing on some, some hard maple round pieces. Uh, and if you've never done this, it's, it's pretty easy to do. There's my dog, Coco. There she is. <laughs> anyway, I, I love that picture. So, okay, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's move along here. Readjust my camera. There we are. And I'm going to show you a couple pieces that 
uh, we're in a box over here. You know what I think I'm gonna, there we go. That's a better, that's a better camera. <clears throat> so this is the way I start these. Okay, turn thin, and usually it's box elder. One reason I've got uh, a, a good access to a lot of box elder burl, and I really don't turn the straight grain stuff because I just got so much burl that might as well use that. So I start coloring that from the inside, and that's what it looks like. Looks like heck. All right, I'm going to get rid of my face. And I leave the tenon on until the very end. I mean, this piece will be completed, 100% completed. And I'll put it between centers and deal with the bottom of that. Yeah, here's one more. It's a little bit more advanced. And, and like I say, they look like heck. But once I finish all the coloring and put a, a, a clear coat, I do lacquer. Uh, they look pretty cool. All right, so here's a couple other pieces of uh, metal reactive paint, which I'm not going to get to tonight. So you put a base coat, like a, like a black or whatever base coat you want for a color, and then you put the metal reactive paint on top of it, and you spray it with a solution, and it just kind of reacts like that. Um, this one here has some iron, and there, there are four different metals, iron, copper, brass, and I always forget one of them. Anyway, <laughs> should have it written down on the back of this piece. But this area right around here is the iron, and it gets real rusty looking. But it's really cool to work with, and it's, uh, it's a good accent if you're doing some, some kind of artwork. Okay, I'm going to readjust my, whoop, readjust my tool rest. Do a little bit of turning. I'm going to do some, uh, some texturing with some Robert Sorby texturing tools. And uh, parts of this demonstration, I will be wearing some form of protection. So I'm going to put my face shield on. And some of this I'm going to use uh, some carving tools. And I'll probably find a little respirator to use. All right. And this is really out of balance here, so I'm going to just level off this, this surface. Okay, now I'm not going to worry too much about uh, sanding tonight. I don't think I really need to. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to uh, take some beading tools. These are D-Way beading tools. And um, Okay. And these really work a little better in end grain than they do in side grain, although they work fine in side grain. And I'm going to just start at the center of this. I'm going to look at my speed. I'm turning right at about 1,000 RPM.
I'm going to get a little parting tool and, and take this center bit down just a little bit so there's a better transition into that bead. I just got this tool the other day. Um, I've got five or six of uh, the D-Way beading tools. I'm going to just get a different uh, size here. And this is something that it's really nice on on the top of a lidded box. Could you zoom that in just just a little bit? I'm going to have my my wife zoom in a little bit on. Oh, thank you. My wife is like the director, which which is very helpful. She said, "Show them the end of the tool." Let me go this way. This is one of the there. How's that? The, these are really marvelous. They're just awesome. You can't you can't make a mistake with these beading tools. Let me do just a little bit more. Maybe maybe leave that there. I'm going to go back to my smaller one. There we go. And it kind of kind of helps if you just take this and rock it a little bit like this. I'm not sure why I'm vibrating. Maybe too far away. All right, now I've got one more. This, this one is... I think it's it's less than an eighth of an inch. I'm not sure what the designation is or the the measurement on this tool is, but it's really really small, and it works best, like I said, in in end grain. We'll just come out here and we'll do a couple right here. All right, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that off. We'll just turn this off. And I'm going to do one more thing while we're here talking about beads. Can somebody tell me uh, approximately how much time? I've got 7.05. When are you going to kick me out of here? Okay, I'm going to do a bead with uh, a point tool. And if you've ever seen my thread chasing videos, you've probably seen my point tool. And you can do a, a pretty, pretty nice bead with a point tool. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to this camera first. There you go. Then you can probably see the motion a little bit better with this. So there's there's my point tool right here. Three bevels, three cutting edges, and a point. Just make some grooves in this. And then I'm going to just connect these. So Sam, do you just go more or less straight in on that? Um, 
Yeah, when I'm doing, just making that V-cut, it's, it's pretty much straight in. Let me turn this off. Um, when you're using a point tool, and that's, and that's a pretty good view of that, <clears throat> if I have the point in the wood, and if my handle is trailing down like that, <clears throat> I'm going to be in trouble. It's kind of like putting a knife edge into a spinning piece of wood. You don't want to do it with the, with the edge up like that. So if my edge, or excuse me, if my point is contacting the wood, I need to have that trailing like that. So let me, let me go through this, just a, a couple little beads. So I got my handle up in the air, and the point is contacting the wood. So I lower the handle, and at some point that, that point needs to disengage from the wood. Okay, like right in here, and I'm twisting the tool around like that. And at this point, the point, <laughs> I keep saying at this point, I need to find a, a, a different descriptor. My, my wife is over here laughing at me. So we'll, we'll do the other side of this. So the handle is up, lower the handle, and I'm going to rotate that in the other direction. I got a little bit of a catch there at the end. I'll just go all the way through this. Let me see. See, that's why I use the D-Way tools. All right, you get the idea. Okay, I'm going to readjust a little bit. I'm going to put these tools away. I have lots I want to show you. I'm going to take this off again with my little spindle gouge. Hey Sam, was that pointy tool bought like that, or did you grind it to that? Um, you can you can buy one of those tools. Let me see here. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Um, you can get these tools from Craft Supplies. I've got a video on how to make one, and it's just a. A, a screwdriver, it's a Phillips screwdriver, and it's really easy to do. And I go through the sharpening and grinding it and everything like that. You can buy them. Uh, my preference for the size is 5 sixteenths of an inch. Somewhere around there, quarter inch, 5 sixteenths, um, works, works pretty good. But they're really, really nice to use. They're, they're great for little detail work. Uh, and, and for thread chasing, they're really awesome. I'm looking around for my my screwdriver point tool, but I don't see it. All right, that's okay, Cheryl. All right. Cheryl's getting to know my tools better than I than I do. Okay, the next tools I'm going to use are are Robert Sorby spiral texturing tools and I bet you a lot of you guys have these. Just a kind of a wheel and um this originally comes with a little cradle that I take off because I think it kind of gets in the way. And if you hold that firmly enough, it's not going to, you know, rotate on you. Um, Nick Agar has an excellent video on these tools. And you can either search Nick or Robert Sorby and it'll come up. And he really gives you a good idea on, on how to uh, use this tool. It's really, it's really cool. So I'll just do some quick, quick talking. And the speed. 
I'm going, I think I'm going a little too fast. Um, I try to turn about 900, 1000 RPM. And if I hold this tool too much like this, the wheel won't turn. So you have to get that, that wheel going right there. And I'm going to press in fairly hard. Oop. Now you heard that at the very end of that. And what happened, it kind of, kind of got out of the groove, but it's okay. You, you can't go wrong with this. Well, maybe you can. <clears throat> I'm actually going to turn that speed up a little bit. And I'm going to raise the handle and, and rotate it just a little bit. And when I get all done with this, I'm going to color it. And then you can really see that a little bit better. I'm going to go dead on to it with the handle raised way up in the air. All right, turn the speed down just a little bit. I'm going to color this. Here it is. <laughs> right where I put it. Let me show you some of my markers. And the, the marker that I really like to use, my, my favorite, it's a, a Faber-Castell. Let me see. Yeah, there you go. And I've got a video on it. My wife tells me don't always be saying that, but it's true. If you uh, search my YouTube channel, you'll find a bunch of different markers that I use. These are from uh, the Dick Blick website. And they've got what's called a paintbrush tip on them. And I really like those. So let's do a little little coloring on this. And this is, this is where this kind of gets cool. Okay, not not bad. And what I like to do is put another color on top of that. Whoop. Would you would you just leave that one zoomed way in? You took it off and I can't get it back. I took what off? Oh, sorry, we're having marital discord here. A, 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 a little a little a little more, dear. <laughs> a little less. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to put I'm going to put another color on top of this. You'll kind of get an idea of what I'm doing. Um, there we go. Yeah, that's really cool. I like that. Um, okay, I'm going to take that off. I do this in a demonstration, and people go, "Yeah, you're going to." Destroy that. Yeah, I can make another one. Um, what, what I used to do in, in this particular part of my demo is <clears throat> I'd have a bunch of these. Here's one I did sometime before. And I would part these off, you know, like a quarter of an inch or something. And I'd give them to kids or something. But that's kind of time consuming. So I've got four or five of these sitting over here ready to go. Um, you know what? I, maybe, maybe what I will do... <clears throat> I'll actually just put another one in there. there. There's another one that I'm looking for a blank one. And if you guys have any questions as I ramble on here, please let me know. Hey, Sam, are there any dangers of catches with a text stream tool? You just got to kind of get a feel for the the speed and whatever kind of wood you're using? Is there woods that it doesn't work on at all? Do you, do you, can you uh, talk about that somewhat? Yeah, I don't think there's any danger of having a catch uh, exactly, but um, be, you know, to me it's better in end grain, works okay in side grain. Um, you just have to get a feel. And, and when I get around here, let me take this off and I'll, if I can remember, <clears throat> 
I'll, I'll make a comment about <clears throat> being in the groove when you when you develop that. Okay. I'm going to get a different a different texturing tool. Um, this particular size comes in two different sizes, and I was using the smaller one, and I think maybe I'll use a a, a combination of the two. So I'm going to go to the very center with the smaller one. And if I'm real careful, if I get lucky, I'll make a little bit of a, a flower right here in the center. Did I get lucky? No, that's hideous. Just a second. That's my, that's my word. That's my favorite word. What I, what I did there was not pretty. Anyway, let me, let me make another, another comment on, on using this tool. Um, yeah, that, that camera is better. If I'm at, at this angle, I get a different texture. If I'm more head on to it, I get a different texture. If I rotate the tool, I get a different texture. Uh, design. Let me let me go from here, and if I just start like right here and pull it towards me and rotate it at the same time, let's see what happens. Hey, that takes a lot of strength. I'm getting old, too old to even do that. Now, that one? <laughs> the, the comment I was going to make is once you've made that groove, I can turn my lathe back on and I can find that groove. Like right there, I can hear it. And if I want to make that indentation a little bit um, deeper, I can do that. Now let me get a, another marker. Let's, uh, I don't know, let's pick a green one. And I'm going to go all the way across this because I, I went all the way across. Yeah, I like it. it there's just a lot of different variations in that. Um, let me find one more color, and I really like to do a couple different colors on this. All right. Yeah. Now you put that on the top of a box. You you turn a um, <laughs> why didn't that work? What the heck? Is, oh, I'm sorry. Things are happening to my computer here that I'm probably causing. <laughs> anyway, you can you can really make a a kind of a plain box into something a little bit uh, cooler. I'm going to do one more thing because I I I owe it to uh, Joe Wagner. If you know who Joe Wagner is, I'm going to take a little bit of this off the side. Hey Sam, what speed do you run at when you're texturing? Um, I'm going 1100 right now. And, and, and does the pattern change with the speed at which you move the tool, not the not the speed of the lathe, 
but the speed of the tool, if you go slower, will it be a different pattern than moving the tool faster? Y yes. I, yeah. Um, and I always use the example that guys from craft supplies like Rex Birmingham and uh, Kirk Deheer, they can use one of these tools and they can predict what they're going to get. I don't always am able to predict what I'm going to get with these tools, but it's so much fun. And the, the, the tool I want to show right now is a Joe Wagner. There it is right there. Texturing tool. Um, some of these tools, I, I think the Robert Sorby is more of a cutter. I think it cuts more. I think the Wagner tool makes more of an impression in the wood. This is a great tool for making acorns. But I just, I just wanted to do a little bit with this one. And it helps if you, you kind of tilt that tool a little bit. And I, I've got to move on because I got way, way too much stuff to show you. We'll put a little color on that. But this is a, um, another really neat uh, texturing tool. And I think it's all about uh, just a different pattern and effect you can get. So you could use the spiral tool on the inside and, and Joe Wagner's tool there. I, that's really cool. Got to show you one more thing. I'm going to take my point tool. And I can just take a, a darker marker. I'm going to turn the lathe speed down just a little bit. Take a darker marker and you can just kind of outline the texture that you just did. Okay. Hey, Sam. Yes. Uh, I have a question in terms of after you're done with your coloring, I think this looks awesome. Oh. What kind of finish do you put on it that, that doesn't muddy the color and make it shift and get all blurry? I'm so glad you asked that question because I'm almost prepared. Um, later on when I do some of the other coloring uh, and in this situation, I like to use this for one. It's a matte finish, that's what it's called, by Krylon. And you can put three, four, or five coats of this on there and it hardly looks like you have anything on the, the, uh, the piece at all. Okay, and I won't spray right now, but um, then what I do on top of that, I'll put a lacquer. Uh, I, could, I could start with a shellac, but that tends to uh, put too much color into the, into the wood. If you, if you rub on like a friction polish, you probably get some bleeding on there. So it's a good idea just to spray something on like that or a, a acrylic lacquer or, or a, just a regular lacquer. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transition here into something else. And I think I'm going to do some uh, airbrushing. Sam, how do you sharpen your beading tools? Just with a, a round file or you just do the outside with a flat file or a flat, flat wheel? Okay, the question is how do I sharpen the, the beading tools? Um, I really don't. Let me let me find one just to hold up here. So, you're you're asking how I would how I would sharpen this tool. I, I just I don't. No, no, not not the texturing tools. What you your beading tools that you were using earlier. Oh, I got you. I think you did say beading. Let me see if I can just kind of replicate what I would do. So let's let's say this is my grinding wheel right here. Okay, here's, here's the beading tool. And I would hold it with the bevel on the grinding wheel. Put the, put the heel on first and then just kind of raise it up till you, till you hit that uh, top cutting edge. And that's all I would do. Never, never touch the, the, the bevel part of it. Does that make sense? So I'm only, only sharpening 
this area right here, that that flat spot. There's there's. Cam, I have those D-Way tools, and I just set my um, rest at 65 degrees, and that just catches them perfectly. Okay. I I didn't know an, an angle, but if it's 65, that's good to know. Okay, I'm gonna. I just have this on a, a screw chuck, this, this piece right here, piece of wood. Let me, let me kind of re, readjust what I'm doing. And earlier today, I was, I was practicing, so I'm gonna do a little bit of airbrushing on this and we'll kind of transition into that. This is a, this is a piece that I, I was just messing around with. <clears throat> And like I said before, I, I don't really like to copy like Nick Agar's Sunset Bowls. This is just a different color combination. Uh, it's okay, you know, uh, you can kind of play around with color combinations. And there's a lot of apps that you can get online. And you can get a, like a color wheel at Hobby Lobby or something. And you can kind of look at colors primary colors, secondary colors, and uh, kind, of, kind of find one that uh, works for you, some combination. All right, I'm gonna get a tool. The, this, this is um, pretty much finished on the inside. I need to level this off. So I'm gonna just take a bowl gouge. with a little bit more speed. Now, I'm not really going to do much with this. I'm, I'm not going to turn it into a bowl or anything, but uh, this part right here looks like the inside of a bowl. I'm going to make this look a little bit more like a rim. My wife's shutting the lights out on me. Time to go home. And what I wanted to do was, I wanted to leave that center a little high. Because I'm going to put a decoration on, on that. And I'm going to just take a negative break scraper. Clean that up a little bit there. Well, he's just an embellishment. Okay. We had a huge technical. Trying to clean up this little center right here, just a little bit. Okay. So, what was your time? Is there a lot of people at the dog park? All right, now anybody out there do any uh, airbrushing? They're, they're afraid to admit it. I'm a, I am gonna do just a little bit of sanding on this because I think it'll look better. I, 
I'm going to see if I can lift one of my uh, airbrush units up so you can at least see it. There we go. You know, I wonder if I need a little bit more more light on that. Is that, a, is that okay? All right. I guess it's okay. Tell your wife to turn the lights back on, Sam. We we got a little bit of a late start, so we got about a you got at least about an hour if you need it. Okay, that sound that sounds great. Um, yeah, let's see here. I'll show you this one first. <clears throat> this is my first airbrush. This is a a pache. I think that's the way you pronounce that. It sounds pretty pretty serious. And what I have here. You have for dinner. And oh my, my cord won't reach. There we go. Th this, believe it or not, is something you might find with uh, makeup. If you if you um, like Google and and makeup airbrush, you'll get something like this. This is like thirty five bucks. It's a little airless compress compressor. Let me get my. So I'm just turning on my, my airbrush. That's what it sounds like. So I'm gonna put that back on the floor. And I've got three colors over here that I'm gonna, I'm gonna hook up. Oh, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put rubber gloves on. <laughs> Yes, dear. Take that light and put it closer. That's all you got to do. I, I think it's probably okay. Is that light okay on here? It looks a little dark to me. No, it looks all right. We can see it pretty good. Okay. All right. I was practicing earlier today, and I just I had my hands a total mess. Okay, now the first color I'm going to use is some amber. <clears throat> and I'm going to just start in the center here. And a good idea is to have like a piece of cardboard. I just happen to have a, a piece of cherry plywood. Now this is a double action airbrush. And if you want to get into airbrushing, uh, I think you you need a double action. So you press this button down and all that comes out is air. And when you're airbrushing, that can actually help you dry the, the color when you're airbrushing. So you press it down, you're just getting air, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull that handle back and, and the color comes out. So if you're really close, See, how do I do this? Let me try this other. Yeah, that'll, that'll be okay. If I'm really close, I get a little dot. Or, whoop. <laughs> or a real tiny little line. When I back that up, it fans it out a little bit more. And you can get like, and it's kind of like a shotgun pattern, I guess. Anyway, um, if you start this on a piece of, like on my finished piece, I may get splatters coming out. So I like to start that on just a piece of paper or something. So I'm going to turn my lathe on a little slower. So. Very carefully, I'll just start in the center of this. And on my practice piece, I noticed that um, my yellow wasn't very dark. It made no sense at all. It, w it wasn't very uh, vibrant, if you will. And if I get fairly close to this, 
I can, I can do a little detail right in there without messing it up too bad. And if I can do that, you know, you got her made. So I can take my air if I want to, like, uh, try to dry that a little bit. What, what I'm using, I should mention this before I get too far, too far afield. <clears throat> I'm gonna change my color, just hang on here. I don't, I don't want you to see the mess I'm making. I've actually got these little bottles labeled. I got three colors and I got them one, two, three, so I make sure I got the right order. Um, I, I use trans tint dye And I start out with uh, a quart jar. You get a little bottle of this trans tint. And you can get this at Woodcraft. Um, I get it, uh, some of it at Stuart McDonald. And this two ounce bottle or whatever this is, two, two ounces, that'll make two quarts. It'll go a long, long way. So I, I start out by mixing up a quart in a mason jar, and then I put them in these little bottles. And, I, and I've got a, like a hypodermic syringe in my quart jars, and I fill that up, and then I fill these bottles up. And I just use those till they're, till they're gone. And the reason I don't use regular airbrush paint is because um, I want this compatible with my lacquer. And, and also this does not cover up the grain of the wood. Okay, so I'm gonna do red. So my next color here. And I'm gonna kinda come out about that far and then I'm gonna do blue the rest of the way. And again, I'm gonna I'm going to start this because I got a new bottle and it could just have some gunk in the in the top of it or something. In fact, the other thing is as I as I do this, I need to get rid of all that amber. You know, and I need I need my red to come through. There you go. You you can see that. I almost forgot to do that. All right. Come on come around here. I'm, I'm really a big klutz. So if, if I can do this, I'm going to go real close until I just start seeing my red come through. So you don't have to wash out the gun in between colors like that? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Let, let me repeat the question. Um, where's my? There we are. Um, I've got to. I've got to zoom my face in and repeat that. You you don't. The question was you don't have to wash out your airbrush in between colors. You should. Okay. <laughs> okay. And if I'm if I'm making like a real masterpiece or something like that. I'm going to take a little bit more time, but but you see what I did there on this piece of wood that that actually worked pretty good. So I, yeah. I I got most of the color out so I could go to my next one. But you you should really be more careful. And let let me show you what I've got over here. Um, this is a I'm going to get I'm going to get rid of my face because it's not helping any. <laughs> This is a little bottle of lacquer. And I was already, I can, I can hook that up to my airbrush and clean that out properly. So yes, that's a really good idea. Um, but for what I'm doing here, eh, it'll work, but yeah. Gotcha, thanks. Yeah, you, you, you caught me, but I, I admitted my, my fallacy, whatever that is. Okay, a little bit more red. 
No, your way just looks quicker and easier. And I'm going to shut that off. I don't want to get too much on there to where it's like puddling or, or uh, running. I'm going to go a little, you know, actually what I could do also, I can, I can spray on this opposite edge over here. I'm kind of cranked around. I'm going to go just a little bit more. Then I got one more color to do. Okay. Change my bottle. I got a big pile of sawdust on the floor here, so if any of this stuff leaks out, it'll go on there. Okay, so finally I'm going to put uh, some blue in here. All right. And again, here's my red. Let's get rid of the red. There we go. Good enough. <laughs> All right. Now this is really the way that I would make a sunset bowl. Only I'm not sure about these colors. They're okay. I'm not sure if I'd use these these same colors. Make that a little bit darker. I'm going to come out here to the to the rim. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to stop there. You get the idea. Now, if you want to get into airbrushing, not that difficult. This, this is a suction feed. And I'm going to show you another airbrush which I would recommend over this kind of of an airbrush. This works fine, and you can have the bottles ready to go and just you just take them out. Let's see. Could you rip me off a bit of paper towel? I'm going to put some paper towel down on my <clears throat> on my lathe. There we go. Just to kind of show you what what this looks like. There we go. And there's a a little suction tube that goes down in inside there. Okay, and it works okay, but I think a gravity feed works better. I'll show you that. Okay, now this this is my my Grex. And this is about five times better than that first gun that I showed you. This is a gravity feed. And if you just pop this lid off, you can just put color in there. And probably with this one, I would take more time to wash that out with some lacquer and it takes about you know like three grams of I mean just very little lacquer spray it through there and you're and you're clean now I got some black in here I'm going to use for another project so I need to take this put it back okay take this off here uh, any questions Oh, I see. I see my next my next project. Okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I'll leave my my gloves on. All right, now I've got. I already showed you that. 
I'm going to show you some gilding. Okay. And recently in the American Woodturner, there was an article by Barry Bryant. Uh, didn't mean for that to start. Uh, anyway, Barry Bryant uh, is an old friend of ours from Wyoming. He was in our club down there. And probably seven, eight years ago, he started to um, do the the Tondo frame, which is a round frame that he showed in that article. His wife is a just an amazing painter and Barry makes the frames and does gilding. And what Barry does is proper gilding. And it's like a 20 or 25 step process. And I mean, you, it's crazy. And if you read the article, you get an idea how complicated that is. What I'm going to show you is really simple. It's easy to do. Ordinarily, I don't use silver or gold leaf. I just use metal leaf, which is like... Well, like, you missed out on an interesting experience. Didn't you hear the dogs going berserk? No. My dog? The dogs were going berserk. I went out there. There was someone at the edge of the dry... Well, over by like evergreen tree, the big blue spruce. And they're barking and barking and barking. Kenny, you need to mute your computer. And a door open. So I get my boots on and my sweatshirt and I start. Kenny! <laughs> Wait a minute, I was just getting into that story. <laughs> okay. Can I mute or not? All right. I'm, I'm trying to. There we go. Okay. This is a video on gilding and I've actually got a, a, a much longer version of this on my YouTube channel. So this is the process that I, that I use for gilding. And uh, let's just take a look. This is actually a piece that I started for the New Jersey Wood Turning Club. That was uh, one of my first remote demos. And I, I did not have hardly any of this completed. This took me six or seven hours to, to get to this point. And the, the lighter colored area is the silver leaf. And I actually used real silver leaf on that. So I'm gonna just take you through the process of, of doing this. And if I were to do this live, I just couldn't do it. I mean, it's, it's too cumbersome. It takes too long to let things dry. So let's just take a look. So I'm going to go through the different steps, preparing the surface, which basically means I'm going to sand this and I'm going to put some gesso on there. That would be the next step. So I'm not going to show you much sanding. Once I do the sanding, I put a little bit of shellac on there. <clears throat> and that's one of my favorite finishes. I just apply a little bit of shellac and then I'll sand that back almost to the wood. So I'm just preparing a really, really smooth surface to eventually do my, my, my gilding. And I, I rarely use real metal leaf or excuse me, real gold leaf or silver leaf, but I did here. Now, gesso is a primer. And I, I think of it as a base to put your uh, gilding on, your leaf. And it's just a, you know, it's, it's like a paint. And you can do three, four, five coats of this, sand each coat back until it's smoother and smoother and smoother. Um, and this came out pretty good. I, I took quite a bit of time doing this. And like I say, I really couldn't do this in a, in a demo. It would just be too difficult. Okay, so I apply several coats of the gesso, let it dry in between coats. And there's a little bit more sanding. And I've got a video showing this and it's probably 40 minutes long. So if you really want to watch that. And I've also got other videos on uh, applying metal leaf. 
Now, the, the sizing is a glue. That's just a fancy word for glue. And you can find the glue in kind of a water-based. I'm using an oil-based uh, size. You can get some that's a spray. And most of the stuff you can get at Hobby Lobby. <clears throat> this is a, a Dux product, D-U-X. Quick dry gilding size. Okay, I'm just going to paint that on. And I'm not showing you most of this. This takes quite a while to do it neatly. But I'm, I'm applying that. And the best I can describe this, it's a little bit like contact cement. If some of you ladies and gentlemen have done any kind of formica work, that's what it ends up to be a little bit tacky. You can kind of test it. It doesn't, it shouldn't be wet, just tacky. And what I'm going to show you is some transfer leaf. This is real silver leaf. And, and what that is, it's like a, oh, like a wax paper. And, and the leaf is attached to it. It's a real easy way to apply it because it's not flying around. It's called transfer leaf. So you just take that and my surface is ready to go and you just uh, turn it upside down and it will immediately stick to it. If I ever get to it, come on. <laughs> Apply the silver leaf, okay, there we go. I'd fast forward, my, fast forward through there, but uh, probably messed it up. So you just take it and <clears throat> kind of tap it down with your finger. And if you use a brush, you can just kind of let it adhere. And it's not a bad idea after you put this on there, let it go for a few hours and then come back to it. It'll stick better that way. Otherwise you kind of brush it off. And it's as simple as that. You just kind of go around and <clears throat> put more of the silver leaf on it. And get some water. <clears throat> it's really fun to do and, and not hard. <clears throat> Excuse me. And unless you're using real gold or silver leaf, it's not all that expensive to do. But it makes a nice accent on a piece. And I've just got a little bit more area there to do. Now one point about real silver or gold leaf is you don't need to put a clear coat on top of it. If you're using metal leaf, you do, or else it'll tarnish. And if I was really fastidious about this, I would have saved all those little pieces because it's, it's a little bit expensive, but yeah. And it's nice to have a really soft brush. You can get those at Hobby Lobby or online. Going to mash that silver leaf down. So Sam, a question? Yes. So what purpose does the gesso serve? Just to make a smooth base for the, uh, for the sizing or what is, yeah, why do you need the gesso on? Yeah, the, the gesso uh, really establishes a nice foundation or base for your leaf. It gives you something to sand, and if you do it three, four, five times, you've established a really nice smooth surface, and, and your, your leaf will look a lot better. Okay. Yeah. And I think, I think, what's that? It's hard to see that that's 
I know. My, my wife made the comment, it's hard to tell that that's silver. Um, it, it looks white. It's in a box in the garage. <laughs> my, my wife asked me where that piece was. Um, would you uh, just set, set that someplace? Okay, where, what's my next, my next victim? Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, I think I am, thank you. Okay, let me, let me go back. Um, while I go to my next project here, you have any questions? All right, I'm going to put a piece of cherry on this. Let me go back to, there we go. This is a, a two inch thick piece of cherry. And I'm going to do some carving with electric carving implements. There we are. I'm going to change my tool rest also. Now, how are we doing for time? 45 minutes? Uh, we got about 35 minutes left, Sam. Okay. That's fine. All right, I'm going to do just a little bit of uh, turning on this. There we go. Okay. Now, that one, we can back that off a little bit so we can see it. Okay. So let me just face this off. I'm not going to probably do a lot of contour, contouring on this, although I really need to do a little bit. Lower this just a little bit. All right. Now I've got this on a face plate with lots of screws going about 1200 RPM. That's all right. <laughs> okay. Now the first carving tool I'm going to use is a Merlin 2. 
Anybody have one of these out there? They're, they're pretty cool. Um, this comes with um, a blade. It's a, it's a chainsaw blade. Would you give me that little black bag there, dear? I can actually show it to them. All right. Now, here it is. Okay, the, the rest of those in there are just sanding discs and whatever. Nope. Let me... Uh, there we are. There's, there's the chainsaw cutter. Um, and I, to be honest with you, I need to practice a little bit more with that. It, it really takes off a lot of wood very quickly. And I think for what I do, um, I need a larger piece of wood, like 20, 30 inches in diameter, something on the order of, of Nick Agar. So what, I'm, what I've got in here is just a, it's a carbide cutter. And this is a, a variable speed tool. I'm going to draw a, a line on here, actually a circle. Okay. All right, now that didn't work, so I'm going to take it off. Just uh, be patient with me for one second. I'm going to just take a take a scraping tool. I I didn't have my surface level enough. There we go. I did this the other day when I was messing around and it worked really well. Okay, so I just have a, a shop pencil here. All right, I wanted my line a little bit wider like that. There we go. Um, now the other thing you can do is you can make you can make maybe lines coming out from the center. One, one of the things we're doing, all of us, we're turning round. So whatever we, we do comes out round. <laughs> that, that's kind of redundant. But if we're making like a wall hanger or something, everything comes out round, which is cool. But if you do something opposite that, like going across this way, um, it just, you know, it just makes a, a kind of a neater effect. I'm going to just go ahead and go ahead and do that. Now I was going to talk a little bit about um, planning or designing one of these things. And I can design these a little bit, but what usually happens after um, maybe just a little bit, they kind of go off course. And then you have to kind of reestablish what you're doing. So I think the best way to design these is um, if you want to do gold leaf or carving or something like that, just practice and have that in your kit and you can apply it. May not work out, um, maybe it will. I've got my headstock um, locked. So I'm going to just take my, my carving tool. And, and like I said, this is a variable speed tool. Okay, back it off. Now, let me make one more comment. I find that having rubber gloves like this, just latex gloves, adds a little bit of texture and I can grip this tool a little bit better. So I'm keeping these on.
Okay. I'm... <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering if I should bring you in closer to that. No, it's okay. Okay, that's, that's terrible. But anyway, you get the idea on, on uh, yeah, that's when you bring your gouge in and you take all that away. Um, let, me, let me do a little bit more. I'm going to do one more thing that might, might work out better than that did. I think what I'll do, yeah, take, take that off and start over. Kind of clean that up just a little bit. All right. I'm going to show you one more thing that might be a little bit more successful. Um, I think something like this would work really well on a burl. You know, just a big kind of a rustic piece. Um, I'm going to turn my lathe on. Oh, the other thing I should mention is when, when, you're, when you're using this, you want to cut against the rotation of the, the cutter. Okay, if you go, go in the other direction, it'll kind of run on you. I'm going to do that one more time. I don't think it's deep enough. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Now I'm going to take my, my little creme brulee torch. And you can find these, you know, if you get on... Amazon Prime or whatever, you can find these. The nice thing about these is they're a little bit more controllable than, than a big gas torch or propane torch. And you could color this. I think airbrushing this would be a good, good approach. Now you might have a question, should you turn your lathe on and do this? It doesn't really work very good. You have to kind of hold that fire on there a little bit more directly. Something else you can do when you're, when you're all done with this, if I get, get this really dark, I can take a wire brush and brush that. Get some of the soot off, which isn't a bad idea anyway. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to show, I'm going to get one more tool. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to do just a little bit of um, airbrushing on this. I've got some black in here and I'm going to, I'm going to color the very center of this black because I want to use another carving tool and you probably won't be able to see it.
Okay, I'm going to turn my lathe on. Maybe that'll help that dry just a little bit. Okay, let's see. Okay, this next uh, tool I've got is a Proxon carver. And I think this would be considered a reciprocating carver. And this is probably a really, really safe tool to use. I could probably put my finger on there, it wouldn't do much. So turn that on and I'm going to just do a little bit of carving on the very center of this. I'm going to lock that again. And what I have in here is a, is a V cutter. The, these come in different configurations, these little cutters. And they're really easy to change. This is already locked so you just, you can unscrew that by hand. Actually, that works pretty good just turning that, that disc by hand. All right. All right, there you go. And I'm just kind of freewheeling this. That's a little bit better view. But anyway, um, any questions at this point? I got one more little carver. I'll, uh, you know what? I think I won't. I want to do, I don't, I want to do one more other thing first. which may be the last thing I do. What do we got, 15 minutes maybe? Yeah, that's about right, Sam. Okay. Unless, unless you want to give us a bonus 15 minutes, that'd be all right too. Hey, I'll, I'll work as long as you want me. Uh, <laughs> let, me let me start this next little, little item here, which... Okay, now let me see here. Actually, this one here. Okay, what? Mm. <laughs> Why is that doing that? There we go. While I am fumbling around here getting ready, do you have any questions? Anybody? I do, Sam. Doug Schneider here. My question is, I hope you're pay paying Cheryl well for all she's doing tonight. No, he's not. <laughs> it's great to hear from you. Actually, my wife gets 5%. Six? Yeah, she's 
She's worth way more than that, Sam. I, I know. She gets it all one way or the other. So, <laughs> all right. Nice, nice to hear from you. It's good, good to hear from you and see you guys too. I hope to get up there someday and see you guys again. I know, and all this craziness ends if it ever does. Okay, I've got a little bowl here. In fact, I I dried this in my microwave, and I still got the numbers on here from from drying that. <clears throat> I'm going to do just a little bit of cleanup on this. While you're finishing that up, on your microwave when you do that, what kind of power and time you use? You know, when I'm drying something in the microwave like this, I don't get real scientific about it. Um, I just set it for 30 seconds, walk away, and I'll do that five, ten times a day. And I'll just leave it in there for three or four days, and I weigh it. And, I, and that's the most important part of it. Um, my, my microwave actually does have power settings, but I don't really worry about it too much. You know, the thing is you don't want to get it too hot. If you, if you do it for like two minutes all at once, that can get too hot. And I've actually sort of caught stuff on fire, sort of. Lignum vitae is not good to put in your microwave. I'm trying to focus here. Come on. And the reason I ask is I use 30% um, uh, power for three minutes and let it dry, cool down, and I'll do that several times just like you do. That, that might make more sense, then you can leave it on there longer. All right. Take my head out of there. Yes, dear. Okay, now what I'm going to do here is one of my favorite things to do is the very center of this is I'm going to put some indentations on there and I'm going to put some black on top of that. I'm actually doing pretty good for what I had prepared, what I wanted to cover. Um, so I've just got to a little box of odds and ends here. Okay. And there's a big point tool. I've got a hammer. I've got a little skew chisel. I got some leather working tools in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take these and bash them into this piece of wood right in the center here. And there's no pattern. I'm not going to measure anything. And I like to use a metal hammer because it just does a little bit better job. And I try to hit that the same number of times. Oh, you know what? Better lock that. If I hit it three times, they should come out pretty much the same. Okay. Now I just walk around my shop. This is this is one of those tools for removing a screw. If you break off the top of a screw. And this doesn't have to be real 
precise. You don't have to measure anything because I'm going to cover this up with black and you won't be able to even see the pattern too much. Now this is a tool for leather working. This just uh, for for stitching. Let's see. This probably isn't real good for your your leather working tools. Okay. Let me get one more in here. Yeah. Okay, I can't jam much more in there. I'm going to go back to my, my airbrush with some black dye in it. Turn my lathe on. Now you have to keep in mind that I'm I'm going kind of fast when I do this and I would take more time Now what I ordinarily do with these pieces like this I would take this off the lathe and put it on a flat surface and I would just flood that area with uh, some kind of black dye. Leather dye works really well. Now I, I need to let that dry for about 30 seconds. But that's a good example of how I use an airbrush. Okay, now do one more thing. I'm going to clean this area up here, um, which is not a bad thing to do. <clears throat> it's easy to do. If you get overspray, you can work from the center out and just start with your other colors if you're doing a sunset bowl. Uh, I'm looking over here to see what kind of tools I have. Now, did I see Camille out there? I think I saw her name. She might have left. I know she was here. I'm just taking a skew chisel as a scraper. And I probably won't do anything more to this. Uh, I intended to, to do some more carving and different things, but probably running out of time. I'm still here, Sam. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm great. Glad you could make it. Yes. Always great to see you, Sam. One of my favorite people down in that part of the world. Um, Trent Bosch does a lot of this stuff, and, and he's probably the first guy I ever saw do this, this kind of work. And, you know, he's much better than I am. Anyway, this is some gilt cream. And this is a Liberon product, and this comes in, I don't know, three or four different colors. This is just some silver. 
Yeah. So I think that's probably probably dry. And that's the nice thing about using that uh, that lacquer based or lacquer thinner colors on there that the dries really fast. So I'm just taking some of that on my finger. Okay. And I'm going to I'm actually going to turn the lathe on because that that usually works fairly well because you can get too much on there. I'm going to just put a little on there. Yeah. Whoop. I'm going to come in just a little bit. These camcorders are really nice because they've got an optical zoom on them and you don't lose any bit of clarity when you're doing these kind of demos. Yeah. And that's probably enough. My wife's over here shaking her head, which means I should just go a little farther. Right? Now, the sequence of doing this is, is kind of important because you make the indentations, you uh, add the color, and then you do this on the very tops of that surface. And then you can see the, the contrast there. Hey, Sam. Yep. This is, this is Chris. Um, how does the Sorby texturing tool work? Um, does that work well as a base to sort of add? In other words, would you do this on using the Sorby tool as well? Yes, absolutely. Let, let me do a little bit of that on the rim of this. I think it's probably trued up enough. If, if you've ever seen Nick Agar demonstrate, and I bet you, a lot of you have, maybe most of you, um, he'll do the entire surface of, of a bowl. And what, what I was going to do, this is going to be the inside example, and this was going to be the outside. And I was going to put this between a friction drive and do some stuff on the outside. I'm not sure if I'll have time for that. Um, but what Nick does is he'll take a texturing tool. Um, let me just find one real quick. And I'll do that. I'll put some gilt cream on top of that. Okay. Now, now one problem I have with this is if you don't put color on it or if you don't like burn it or scorch it, you really can't see it very well. So let's put some gilt cream on here. See what it looks like. Um, another good outlet for gilt cream like this is uh, Chromacraft. They got, they got a lot of different colors and a lot of different good... good uh, coloring formats or, or techniques. I don't think I'm going to get it on there very... Oh, you know, you know what I missed? I didn't color the, the surface of that. Okay, that was, that was a major mistake on... You know, I can, I, I'm going to do it, whether I should or not. That, I'm, I'm going, that's not showing up. It's getting late and I'm getting r rummy. Put a little bit of that, there we go, and that black on there. This will work better. Okay. Oh, very good. I, th I think I'm actually running out of my 
my dye in that airbrush. Okay, that'll be better. Try this again. I'm also going to turn this in reverse. And that may cover that a little bit better. Not a bad idea to go in both directions. Okay. Oh yeah. How's that? <laughs> okay. Now that's not bad, but I think it would come out a little bit better if I had a clear coat on top of that. The other, the other issue is my indentations are not very deep. But you get the idea. The, the center came out better, but yeah, that, that black is really important. It gives you that little bit of contrast on there. 8.30. Uh, why don't we open this up to some questions? Maybe. There we are. Couldn't find myself. Uh, any questions? I have videos on everything I've showed you. Uh, One the question here now, would you, uh, with the gilt cream on there then, do you put any kind of a lacquer or something over that then, or is this the finished product? No, that's a good good question to revisit. I mentioned um, matte finish, yes. This this matte finish, and I'm I'm going to have to this stuff here, and and you don't need to use this. You can just use like like a lacquer. Um, I I like to use acrylic lacquer. It dries really fast. You could use a polyurethane spray, but it needs to be a spray. And then you just put two or three coats on there. And depending on how glossy you want that or, or not glossy. And so that would go over the gilt cream then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the comment was that should go over the, the gilt cream as, as your final application. And you can put as much finish on there as you want. You can make it look more natural, I guess, uh, not real glossy. Okay. Sam, I was just thinking of a variation of that. If you did your texturing, you did your black paint, and then touch it with some fine sandpaper, take some of that black paint off, and put a color on top of that instead of the black. Yeah, you can do a million different things. That's a good idea. Um, in fact, let me... Oh, you took my... Uh, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll just explain this. When, when I'm doing my hollow forms and I'm applying color, um, if I get too much color on the outside, I'll just take some, some lacquer thinner on a paper towel and kind of wash that and make it uh, kind of dissolve a little bit or take some sandpaper on the outside of that. It's all about controlling the color. And, and that's a good idea. You can just do, you know, experiment, have fun. Um, and, and I usually go out in my shop and I start making something and I just, you know, it looks good and I do that. If it doesn't look good, <clears throat> as I did before, you can just take it off. You can just, you can just turn it away if your piece is thick enough. And sometimes I turn out some really, really thin pieces. <laughs> it's okay, you can laugh. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just, that didn't work, and I take it off. That didn't work, and I, uh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. Oh, you know, I'm going to show you one more thing while we're just kind of standing around here. I've got a little shop tour 
then I'm gonna I'm gonna queue up and get me out of the out of the way. I've actually got a YouTube video on a longer shop tour, but I'll just let this thing run. And I'm approaching my house. We are out in the middle of nowhere. It's really cool. There's my house, there's my shop, and I'm driving up with Coco, who's just sitting right over here on my wife's lap. There's my shop. Way back in the right corner is where we're at right now. And feel free to jump in there if you have a question. I'm just kind of babbling on. Some nice storage shelves I bought. My shop in Worland was a cluttered mess. Yeah, I, I, my wife said I can't see my lays. There they are. <clears throat> That's my scout in the foreground, and in the back is the Sweet 16 I'm working on right now. And I've got my green screen up where that plywood is. That's pretty much it. Questions, please. What do you have for dust collection? I have a Tempest. I got it from Penn State Industries many, many years ago. Um, two horsepower. It, it's in my, I don't know if I can get back there, but anyway, it's in my cold storage room. Yeah, I can't do it. Well, anyway. Okay. So I've, I've got my, uh, my air um, collection system back there behind this wall, and I've also got my air compressor, so it cuts down on the noise which is really nice. And, and behind me, I've got all the tubes running. There's a couple of sheets of plywood here on the wall that cover up all the, the, the tubing for my dust collection. And that, that runs along this, this wall back here behind nice. me. Sam, would you tell me the name of your reciprocating carver, the brand? Yeah, um, it's a Art Proxon. Fun. It's a Proxon. Let me let me reach over here and, and find this thing. It's this right here. It's a P R O X X O N Proxon. I don't know if that's too close. Anyway, Trent Bosch has another one similar, which is a, a lot more heavy duty, but I think he probably does lots more carving than I ever do. And, you know, he can put that to use. But this is a nice little tool. It's not real, real expensive. Um, let me show you one more tool that I didn't get to. Th this is a rotary tool. It's, um, see if I can remember the name of this thing. I got this from uh, Craft Supplies. And see this shaft here? The motor is in this unit right here. So the, the shaft rotates or turns from the motor all the way to the carving unit. And I would not recommend getting one of these. Okay, even though I just showed it to you. The, uh, the connection comes loose in here once in a while. You got to redo the whole thing. But uh, I was going to show this when I was carving. Let's see, what is that? And it's a, it's a pretty good unit. I'll just do a little bit on, on this.
Anyway, that's that's a pretty good little unit, and you can buy them um, with the motor in in the handle part right here, and they can get real expensive. This is a cheapo. Oops. Anyway, one more thing. All right. How are we doing? I think we're good, Sam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. I, I appreciate you having me. I've got some great memories of uh, the Rocky Mountain Wood Turning Symposium, and we hope you're there next year. So thank you. We hope you can join us next year. I'll be there. <laughs> My mask on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thanks again, Sam. Okay, thanks. We'll see you. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Cheryl, and say hi to Coco. All right. <laughs>